Amen. How many are excited to be in God's house today? Make some noise. Amen. For those of you at our Discovery Northwest campus, our Cal State campus, or online, wherever you're at, can you just welcome the body of Christ joining together in one place? So glad that you guys are here. We began this series called Unstoppable last week on our anniversary Sunday, celebrated 10 years, and we shared a lot of vision about what we believe God is going to do next in our church, in our city, and abroad. We believe that our best days are ahead of us. Can I get an amen, church? Amen. You should have got one of these last week, one of these unstoppable booklets. If you didn't, make sure before you leave today, go to the Unstoppable Center in the lobby, grab your book, the packet, there's a whole bag, some stuff in there for you. I would love for you to see where we're going. There's a lot of stuff in here about some of those next steps, like, like the, the counseling center that is now open, by the way, taking appointments. There are Discovery College, our missions to Uganda and Mexico, where we're planting churches and, and helping orphanages and helping rescue children who are entrapped through sex trafficking, you guys, in Uganda and in Mexico. And, and these are in our Dream Center here locally and the expansion of our worship center and ministries here at Discovery Church. In case you missed it, I put a, a picture on the screen here that shows the different phases. Uh, there's, there's a lot inside the booklet. But phase one, just so you guys know, I didn't tell you this last week, but phase one is the building, the purchase of the land that our admin building is on right now. We're leasing that property. That needs to be purchased. And then we would build the 1,250 seat worship center. Now, amen, we're excited about that. But even that's not going to contain what God is going to do and wants to do through his church. We need to multiply and plant churches. That's going to help us do more uh, good for the kingdom of God as we take that step. But as we move out of this building, this building becomes now elementary age kids ministry. That's phase two. So once we're out of here, we can then fix this all up and create an elementary age space. That building, that Discovery Kids building will just be like nursery preschool age. And we'll be starting a preschool, like active preschool there uh, for the community and our members with uh, an amazing discount as well. So there's a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff you can see in the booklet. Inside of the bag, there's a commitment card as well that I gave out last Sunday. And I asked you guys to take this and to pray about it, just to maybe go on a journey with us about what God would have you do to partner with your church family to see God do something amazing in our lifetime that we would leave a legacy, that we would go on a journey of loving God, finding freedom, loving each other, and changing the world, and then using this, and we prayed over every one, these are sacred. I believe God's going to use them in your life to stretch your faith, and he's going to use them in our church to do something amazing. Um, Just using that commitment card to discern, prayerfully discern, what God would have me do Uh, in this unstoppable initiative. Now, and Veronica and I, by the way, our family, we went first because we've known about this for a long time. And so we've been praying for a while and and already have some things in our heart that we know and we're leading the way in sacrificial generosity more than we have ever done before because we believe we want to leave a legacy for the kingdom of God. We want to see God do something great in our lifetime and through this ministry. So, and not only like financially sacrificing, but there are what's called like stored resources that we have. We have, and everyone's got some stored resources. Like I got, I got a whole bunch of cards. I was a nerd when I was, okay. So I got like baseball cards and different comic books and, and football cards and then, and then trading game cards. And, and so, but they're worth a lot of, it might be nerdy, but they're worth a lot of money now, you guys. And so those are all, I'm like donating those to Unstoppable. And, and so here's what we want you to do. Go on the journey with us. Just go on the journey, whatever that looks like for you. And, and I believe God's going to do it. Amen, you guys? On, on October 8th, Sunday, October 8th, we're having all the commitment cards all together, church family, bringing those commitment cards together to the church on that Sunday, giving our unstoppable commitment. So until now and then, just pray about what God would have you do in going on that journey, and that's the next step. How many of you guys believe God can do it? Amen? Amen. Okay, tuck that away for just a moment and grab your sermon notes because I need you to believe, you guys, to believe that God's plan for your life 
is good. Do you believe that? That God's plan is good? Like, I, I, I gotta have, like you got to truly believe this, you guys. Like, in fact, the scripture declares that God, by his mighty power at work within us, is able to do exceedingly abundantly above that which we can ask or even imagine. But the reality is, you guys, as we follow God and he reveals his will to us, many times we stop growing, we stop following God, we stop listening to his will and his leadership and his word in our lives. And in this series, I want to help you recapture the wonder of the exceeding abundant plan of the goodness of God for your life. Today, we're going to talk about unstoppable community, unstoppable community where we just don't stop sharing our authentic selves and we don't allow things to prevent us from coming together. Now, last week I shared with you as we begin this series, I shared with you that there's this God-shaped hole inside of our souls and our hearts that can only be filled by that connection and relationship with God. We talked about that last week, but today, kind of similarly, there's another truth about how you were created, and you may have heard this before, but you were created for community. God wired you this way, and he designed you this way, but today I want to do something with you, because I want to answer the question, like, what did God do, though, in creation that caused that vacancy in your soul that could only be filled not only by God, but if you're created for community and there was something in, his, in the, the, the design of mankind that actually wired you this way, what was it in creation that actually made us this way? So I want to study this theologically with you. Can I get some theology with you guys so we can get our... Because some of you may, may understand this. You may have heard that, yeah, yeah, we're created for... Yeah, we were made for community and we're made for this connection. We got a whole... But what actually did God do in creation? And I hope that today some things are going to click. There's some things that are going to click as you get the, your, your theology right when it comes to how you were designed and created by God. So to do this, we're going to go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible in, in, in Genesis, because God did a few things in the very beginning. This story that maybe many of you know, and a lot of you have probably heard about creation and Adam and Eve and stuff, but God did two different things in creation. He actually created some things, and he made some things. And you go, well, what's the difference of that? Well, check this out. A created thing comes from nothing. Okay, so God says, let there be light, and bam, there was light. God has that creation power. He can manifest, okay? He can create something from nothing. Okay, well, that's what created is. But what does it mean to be made then? What's, how is made different? A made thing comes from something that had already existed. Okay, so if I were to give you a lump of clay and you got that clay and you, you made yourself a little house, you made the house. You didn't create the house. You made a house from already elements and materials that already existed, okay? So let me show you one of those examples in the scripture in Genesis chapter 1, verse 11. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees for the land. So God didn't say, let there be trees, and trees showed up. No, no, no. He said to the earth, earth produce trees, you say, well, Jason, why is that important? Check it out. For everything he made, the reason he made it instead of creating it is because he wanted there to be a relationship from that which he was making it. So when he made something from something, he always wanted those things to be close. So he said, hey, earth, produce some trees. Now, tree, you were created from the earth and you are going to be sustained by the dirt, and you're going to go back to the dirt one day, so stay close to the dirt. But the moment, tree, that you try to disconnect yourself from the very thing that I made you from, tree, you're going to die. You cannot, you cannot disconnect from which I made you. Are you guys seeing this, okay? That's that he made it from it, so we stay connected. So here's the question. Was mankind created or made? Oh, we were made. Look at Genesis from what were we, were we made then? Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind from us, from our image. Let, let, let's make them part of us and put in mankind, let's put them in our image. So every one of us was made from God. Why is that important? Because you came from God, you're going to be sustained by God, and one day you're going to return to God. 
And then some of you go, well, no, 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 pastor, I heard that we were made from the dirt and we will turn from the dirt. No, 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 listen, your body was made from the dirt and your body will be sustained by the dirt and it needs to eat the fruit of the land from the dirt and you're going to get your nourishment from the dirt and when you die, your body goes back to the dirt from where it was made, but your spirit was made from God. And that were, To be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. That's, so, so what did God, God did something beautiful though when it comes to the creation, because even this dynamic connection being made between man and God, we see now in Genesis chapter two, verse 18, God looks at this creation and goes, this ain't good for him to just have connection with earth and connection with me. He's still not complete. This doesn't look enough like me. It's not good for man to be alone. So, so what he did is he made woman. But when God made woman, what did he do? Did he say, let there be woman? What did he do? He took the rib from the man and made woman from man. Well, why did he do that? Why, can't he, why didn't he just create the woman? He did it with the man. Let there be. Because he always intended, listen to me, for there to be a relationship, a connection. A, a, you, 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 you have to have this connection. And the moment you think that you don't need it, you're going to die. You, you, you are sustained. And this isn't, just, this isn't just the connection between a husband and wife, because all of us come from Adam and Eve, and every one of us now need each other because of how we were created and designed by God. Not only for connection with God, but you were created, designed intentionally by God to have connection and community with others, which makes the deception of the serpent in the Garden of Eden so schemingly devisingly uh, masterful because he not only with one deception he severed connection between man and God but he also damaged our connection with our brothers and sisters At the same time one lie destroyed connection with God and damaged our connection with other people now listen to me guys when you live in damaged connection whether with God or with other people, when you live in that damaged connection, you're allowing the deception of the enemy to run your life. You are living from the place of the fall. You are living from a place of deception in the old man, not in the redeemed man. Anytime that you allow yourself to be disconnected from God or disconnected from others, you are living from your fallen nature, not your redeemed nature. Okay, are some things clicking? Because I just need you to see that theology when we're talking about this, this community of how we were created for community. Because some of you are like, I'm good. No, no, God says it's not good to be alone. It's not good. You're like, well, no, I'm good. God just got me in a season of isolation. No, that's a lie of the enemy. Isolation is different from solitude. Solitude is temporary when we run to God for refreshing and connection. Isolation is prolonged when we run away from people and from our problems. It's not good for man to be alone. God hates isolation. God hates loneliness. That doesn't mean everybody needs to get married this week. Some of you may be, okay, okay, but just I'm just saying, okay, but that doesn't mean that, but it does mean everybody needs a spiritual family, Amen. and that's why God created the church. Romans chapter 12, verse 5 says, just as there are many parts to our bodies, so it is with Christ's body. The church is often called the body. We are all parts of it, and it takes every one of us to make it complete. God designed it this way. Just as he did man and woman and all of creation, he designed his body to work this way, that all of us would be a part of it, making it complete, for we each have our different work. Look what he says. So we belong to each other, and each needs all the others. I like how the voice paraphrase says it. We become together what we could not be alone. Oh, but I'm better off alone. I'm better off without him. Who needs him? You do. You need it because we become together what we could not be alone. So if today you've allowed yourself to stop when it comes to community, you've allowed yourself to maybe stop at just sharing the 90% of you and not the final 10% of what's really going on in your life, it's probably for a few reasons. Let's look at together some roadblocks to authentic community, and then we're going to talk about how to experience unstoppable 
community. If today you're, you're not experiencing this, it's probably for one of a few different reasons. Take some notes with me, write them down. The first roadblock, I hear it all the time, is busyness. We're just so busy, so distracted, You've got so many things going on in the calendar. Here's what, I hear it all the time. Number one reason, I just don't have the, the time, the time, as if it works different for you than everyone else, you know what I mean? Everyone has the same amount of time, we're just not using it the same way. And you make time for whatever is valuable. And I understand that there are different seasons that, are, that may demand more of your time in other things, but, but you need to get your time in line with your design. You need to get your time in line with your design. You were created for this. And if you're too busy to experience community, I think that we need to recheck the commitments of our calendar. Where, where, where am I, what am I saying yes to that's preventing me from actually being in line with my design and living from this place of a redeemed man, it's busyness can be a roadblock. Psalm 127 says, unless the Lord builds the house, it's labors, it's builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord protects the city, the watchmen guard, stand guard in vain. In vain, he says, you rise up early and you stay up late working and toiling and grinding for something to eat, for, for more, for a bigger home, for a nicer this, for he, but he gives sleep to his beloved. We labor like crazy day after day, night after night, week after week, month after month, year after year, trying to build houses without including God's blueprints. But if you're too busy to even try, just one moment of connection with some community with brothers and sisters in Christ. Let me challenge you today. God doesn't just want you to attend church. He wants you to belong to a family. Busyness can be a roadblock for some of you to actually experience this. Here's, here's the second. The second roadblock is, and I'm just going to like, this just needs to be in here, social media. Social media is a roadblock. I mean, I'm not against social media. There, there, there's a lot of great benefits to social media, but it's only good when it's a supplement to relationship, not a substitute for relationships, okay? And in, in our culture today, it's very, it's used as a substitute. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 17 in the FBV says, a friend is someone you may or may not know well who accepts your friend request on Facebook. FBV, by the way, is Facebook version, <laughs> which isn't a real version. I'm not being her heretical right now, you guys, okay? This person is born to like and comment on your post and to make you feel good about yourself. Now, that's not real, but, but let's be honest. Social media is impacting our relationships and how we define friendships today. Proverbs 17, 17 in the real Bible now, okay? Let's pre let the real word says this. A friend is someone who loves at all times. And a brother is born for a time of adversity. Wouldn't that be amazing if you had a handful of friends who loved you all the time? Not just for a short season of your life, but I'm talking about for decades where you get to know their spouses and their children and their spiritual cross-pollination and you're teaching them things and learning. They're learning from you and you're learning from them and you make each other better and you love each other enough to actually tell each other the truth and to kick each other in the backside when you're messing up and acting like an idiot. Like an idiot. And, then, and they'll celebrate with you when it's going good and cry with you when it's going bad. What if you had a community like that? There are some roadblocks to this, the busyness or social media. How about this? Just really flat out selfishness. Just selfishness where we're just so consumed with self, our own desires that we don't have time to put energy, focus, or intention into any other relationships all about our needs and even our pleasure, our entertainment, our gaming, our watching, our grinding, our increasing. We're so selfishly consumed that we don't have time to be in line with our design, to experience authentic community. But James chapter 3, 16 says, for where you have envy... In selfish ambition, he says, there you're going to find disorder and every evil practice. And in and, and your life, if, that's, if it's been consumed by your own stuff and you got no time for nobody else, I promise you this, your life's out of order. It's out of order. And not only that, you probably, if you're not there yet, you got some evil practices that you picked up along the way because you're not living 
from the redeemed man. You're living from a fallen nature. You were created for community with God and with others. Here's another one. It's huge, huge one. A barrier for us to experience authentic community is relational wounds. Those past experiences that you have are keeping you from new relationships. Because you, like, because history has proven to you, right? People suck. They suck. That's what you believe. They suck. Pastor, they suck. I got all the proof, too. Let me show you. This one sucks. This one sucks. That one sucks. They all suck, okay? They're all bad. But when you look back in your past and you see these wounds and stuff, here's what happens. We take those woundedness and those experiences and that very thing, that wound drives my decision making in my, my, my friendships, in my future. Instead of, listen to me, instead of doing that, because when you do that, listen, you're giving an open door to the enemy. He's using your wound as an open door for a stronghold in your life to bring shackles and to keep you bound by that very thing. But what if you were not infected and affected by that wound, but you invited the Holy Spirit to it? You said, you, you didn't make decisions based on the wound, but you said, God, what are you trying to teach me with this wound? What, what's the lesson here, God? What are you trying to show me? Show me, God. And then from what God reveals, from the revelation of the experience, you now make decisions based on revelation. Oh, see, I think that some of you, you think you're healed. You're like, no, but I'm good. I'm good. I mean, I, 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 I've moved on. But, but some of you like to think you're healed, but you're just isolated with no one to trigger you anymore. I'm fine, I'm fine. And it, because, because here's the deal. Because some of you, you're, you're, when, you, when you try to step back in, you're so true. It's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Because you're so wounded, you got all the proof, you got all the facts, and when you try to do it again, you try to get friends again, you try to get a relationship again, they prove you wrong, and you go, see, I knew it, I knew it, people stop. Told you, people stop. And it's not really, understand, people got issues, we all got issues, but that's not it. That's not the issue. The issue is you never healed from your wound. Philippians chapter 3 says, brothers and sisters, I don't consider myself to have taken hold of it. Like, I'm not there yet. I'm going to offend some people, he said. This is the apostle Paul. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my foot in my mouth, and I haven't figured it all out yet, though. And, and, and so it's going to happen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create issues. I'm going to be part of those issues. I'm going to have to say I'm sorry. But one thing I do, I'm going to forget all that junk behind me, and I'm going to strain toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I'm not going to be allowing the wounds of my past to affect my decisions anymore. I'm pressing on. I'm moving forward. I'm moving forward. These relational wounds are keeping us from, from being connected in authentic community. It's stopping it. It's a roadblock. How about this one? Write it down. Fear is a roadblock for many people. Because what if they see the real me? What if they see, what if they know what I've done, you know, or what I do? Or what I did yesterday, you know, they, they, they'll think different of me. They'll lose respect for me. Maybe they won't even like me, or maybe they'll just reject me all outright. There's this fear that's motivating our isolation. Fear isolates us. It prevents us from stepping into God's purpose and plan for our lives. It prevents us from stepping into honest, authentic, vulnerable connection with community. This is exactly what happened to Adam and Eve in the garden, right? The deception of the enemy comes in and, and, and he deceives and they buy in. They take the fruit. It causes disconnection with God and disconnection with others, but they're filled with fear. And fear produces some things. And you can see it in the story. Let me show you. Pick it back up in Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. It says, at the moment their eyes were open and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. And not only their, this isn't just a nakedness physically, yes, but there's a shame of of what I did. It's, it's, oops, I messed up, and now I see that, and they see that, and I don't like how that feels. So what they do? They sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. And then the Lord called to the man, where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid, because I was afraid that you would see me, like the real me, the naked me. Here's what happens when you allow fear to dictate your relationships and your decisions. Number one, it produces shame. They felt shame 
over what they did. They felt like, this is who I am. This is what I did. And, I, and because of the shame, and they didn't deal with the shame appropriately, what they do? They covered it up. They covered up, remember, they covered up with some fig leaves. We don't use fig leaves today. Some of you use humor to cover up your shame. Some of you use your online persona or personality to cover up your shame. You use, you use this, this you use different things to cover up. Some of you use a smile to cover up the real you. We, we, we have this shame and we, we cover it up and ultimately what that does, it produces distance from God, a disconnection, fear isolates us from God. We, we have this testimony that we recorded for you about unstoppable community and the impact it can make on your life. Check this out. I think a big part of my story is my community and um, the sisters around me that I have and my church family around me. So my name is Mallory and Discovery has meant home. It's meant finding Jesus, the purest form of Jesus for me. I kind of grew up in church because of my sister. She was the kind of lead way into church for our family. So I grew up um, in church, going to Sunday school, small groups, everything like that, going to church camps, so heavily involved, but more so um, just for the fun of it. All my friends were in it, so I was like, yeah, let's go, something to do, right? But I think what changed my faith heavily was when my parents got a divorce. Once I hit that point in my life, it happened um, my freshman year of high school. And from that point, um, suppressed a lot of what I needed in my life and just wanted to find stability and safety and whatever I could. You know, the college lifestyle um, definitely held me captive for a little bit. Honestly, COVID kind of saved me um, from going out and doing those things, but um, I remember it was after COVID, it was my senior year. Um, I was going out all the time um, with my friends and um, just drinking and doing all those things. And I was never fulfilled by anything that I was doing. Like, I knew that. I woke up one morning after and my friend was saying that she was gonna go to church. And I like woke up and I was just like, I'm gonna come with you. Went to church, happened to be Discovery Church. So um, I went and from that moment, it was like a refresh in my soul and my spirit. And it was something that, that's what I was longing for, that belonging of coming to God again. And he met me there. Like he was working all things together. I needed to fall straight on my face at that moment to be able to come um, back to Christ. And the overwhelming sense of peace that I felt was something that I always longed for and knew that Jesus had for me, but I didn't know how to receive it. But at that moment, I didn't have to do anything. I was just worshiping and He gave it to me. So it was like the gift that He gave me was peace. And I think that was like a highlight in my faith and um, discovery, like just the environment that they make accessible for us to experience Christ in that way is just beautiful. I think the biggest life change moment for me at Discovery was I got involved in a small group, ended up sitting by now my five best friends, my sisters. So it's just how God orchestrated that moment. And I remember everyone was like, you should go to tracks, you should go to tracks, you should get involved. And at that time, I had the dream of working in fashion. And that was where I thought I was gonna go. I had everything lined up for me, actually. I was all ready to go to move to San Diego. I had a job lined up there. I was gonna start that journey. I remember they were telling me go to tracks, get involved, and I was like, no, because I knew in my in, in myself that if I would go, I would get attached. I decided to go to tracks, and I got involved with YA. I met more of my family. Something in me was not settled when I thought about moving to San Diego, because I had, this is something that I longed for in my faith. This was something that I never had in my faith before, was this community and fellowship and I decided not to go to San Diego and that was a big faith move because I had a job and everything lined up. I graduated so it was like now what am I supposed to do? You know, I, I was very like ambitious but I realized that my ambition before I met Christ was driven by anxiety of fear of um, not wanting to make mistakes but now from that moment it's like God changed my ambition to faith through what Jesus calls in my life. It's not driven by fear, it's driven by what his call is for me, my security and that. It's been a journey. That moment that God met me at Discovery and gave me that 
peace in my spirit and my soul was something that I always prayed for, that I didn't know back then that I was praying for. But he showed up and he, he gave me that peace. So if I could describe unstoppable in one word, I would say powerful. He's just gonna do his thing and I can't wait to see everything that he does. Come on, isn't that awesome? What a powerful testimony. Our small groups have started last week, and if you haven't gotten connected to one, um, and you're really serious about going all in and, and living this life, getting God's vision for your life, to love God, find freedom, love each other, and change the world, then you need to be connected to a small group. You can go online and find it after the service in the lobbies or in the canopies, wherever they're at. Go grab the cards and get connected to a group. I'm going to give you, if you get connected to a group, how to, how to have authentic community, though. I'm going to give you five keys to unstoppable community. Five keys that if you, as you're doing life together, this is going to help you out if you want it to be unstoppable. Number one is this. Be intentional with your circle, like your inner circle. See, we meet friends by chance, but we deepen them by choice. The inner circle, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you love God, if you, or if you want to, your life to change and you want it, your inner circle needs to be people who are committed followers of Jesus. It must be. Jesus is a great example of this. He loved everybody equally, but he didn't treat everybody equally. I'm going to say that again. He loved everybody equally, but he did not treat everyone equally. He called 12 to be his apostles to himself, and he spent more time with them. And even of those 12, he called three to be in an inner circle, Peter, James, and John, even further. There were times where there were still miracles and healings that needed to be done, and he had to draw a line in the sand and say, I'm finished for now. I need to rest. I need to go be with my father. Jesus was a friend of sinners, yes, but he was intentional with his inner circle. Show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. I could tell you the trajectory of your life by looking at your top five friends. I love that Mallory's testimony. She said she found these five friends because they've done studies that reveal that you are the average of your five closest friends in every aspect of life, from the income level that they make to their marriage, their, ha their habits, their hobbies, their, their kids. Chances are, if you got high last night, two or three of your closest friends got high too. Why are you looking at me like that, like people didn't get high? People got high last night, okay? And if, if, if yesterday, sometime yesterday, you pursued God, you got into the Word of God, and you actually, you read some of your Word, chances are two or three of your friends, your closest friends did too. Even if they didn't do it with you, they did it. You know why? Because you're doing it. You will become like whoever you are closest with. You are the average of those. It actually is a really good exercise if you actually write down, take some time to write down who are the five closest friends you have in your life. And the question becomes, do you want to become like those on the list? Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. 1 Corinthians 15 says it like this, do not be misled. Bad corru company corrupts good character. You know why he said, do not be misled? Because it's easy to be misled. Because even right now, as I'm teaching this and sharing this scripture, some of you are rationalizing some of your friends. Oh, but not that bad. I've known them so long. You know, they're really a good person. If you, I, and you know, I get that. Like maybe for other people, they would influence them that way. But not me. Don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. I like to say it like this. It is impossible to live a right life when you have the wrong friends. You cannot live a God-honoring life when you have God-dishonoring friends. Every area of success in my life, I can direct, direct it back to people who led me to the right mindset and the right actions. God used the right people to influence me in the right direction. But on the other side of that, when I got into big trouble... In previous seasons of my life, I rarely got into trouble alone. Almost every time I was running with people, doing the wrong things, running the wrong direction. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. 
There's two things that I won't let my friends do. I will not let the people that I'm allowing into my life, I will not let them influence me in two ways, you guys. Here it is. I will never let my friends distract me from God's plan for my life. You are not going to be in my inner circle. I'm not going to be with you. If you're distracting me from God's plan, this is exactly what Jesus did with Peter, one of his inner circle friends, when Jesus was explaining his death, and Peter goes, no, we got plans for you. What did Jesus do to his buddy who has well-intentioned distraction for his life? Matthew 16, 23, Jesus turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. If you ever need to make a point, just call your friend Satan. They'll know you're serious. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. (laughs) You're a stumbling block to me. You don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. What was he doing? He was drawing a line. I'm not going to let you distract me. No, no, no. If you're going to be here, you are not going to distract me for God's purpose in my life. I don't know what that looks like in your life uh, with your friendships. Maybe you're trying to be committed to going to church and you got friends in your life that are like, oh, you're leaving already? You're going to church again? You went last week and they're trying to pull you away from it and talk you out of it. Or maybe you got people in your life like, you going to group again? Really? You, or you got people that are saying, you give too much time to the church. You just serve too much. Here's, I will not allow anybody in my life that is going to distract me from God's purpose for my life. The second thing is this, I'm not going to allow you to continually tempt me to sin. I'm not going to allow someone in my life that's continually tempting me to sin. An incredible example of this is Joseph. We studied Joseph earlier this year where he found favor with Pharaoh and Potiphar, his boss, and evidently he, he found favor with Potiphar's wife too. Genesis chapter 39 Potiphar's wife caught Joseph by his cloak and said, Hey, big stud, take me to bed or lose me forever. I'm just kidding. He said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. He didn't stick around. He didn't didn't say, oh man, it sounds like you really need Jesus. Let's pray together. (laughs) You know what? Why don't you meet me for coffee? We're going to study the Bible together. No, he didn't. He got away from that chick. She's dangerous. You ain't going to be around me if you're going to tempt me to sin. Some of your friendships need to be redefined. And again, I don't know what it looks like in your personal friendship circles, but maybe you're around people that gossip too much. They just, they just talk about people all the time, and you, and you got you to gotta confront that. Look, hey, you know, my brother and my sister, if you're going to talk about people like that behind their back, I'm not going to be here for that. I just, I'm not going to allow that in my life. When you do that, just know I'm walking out of the room. I'm not going to have that in my life. You're going to have to redefine some people that are tempting you to sin. Or ladies, if you're around other ladies that are constantly bashing the men in their life, t- trashing down their husbands, listen to me, your marriage ain't going to be no different. You're the, you're the average of that. You need to draw a line and say, look ladies i'm not gonna we we get together we can't be doing that or else i can't hang out with you guys our guys when you get around other dudes and they're always not talking about girls or calling them out you see that one oh you need to draw a line and say bro i'm sorry but if you're going to talk like that and be doing that i can't have you in my life Okay, I'm not going to allow it. These are just things that you gotta, you got to be so intentional with your inner circle if you want to have unstoppable community, the right community. Number two, be present. i got to be quick. Be present in the moment. We're going to develop friendships face-to-face, not thumbs-to-thumbs. You know, you're sitting at the table together and all you like this, man. Put the phones down for a little bit. Face to face, Hebrews chapter 10 says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and goodness. You're, you're, you're not in the moment. You're supposed to be thinking in that moment of ways to spur, to encourage, to motivate, to capture this moment, but you're always in somebody else's moment. You're always looking at their moment, commenting on their moment, liking their moment, comparing their moment when your moment is passing you. Be present in the moment and let us not neglect our, say it out loud, let us not neglect our meeting together. Thanks for saying it out loud. <laughs> the Greek word for these two other, this meeting together, it's only, it's only used twice in the New Testament. It means meeting physically with a spiritual purpose. That's literally what it means. It means to meet physically 
with a spiritual purpose. And so he's saying we're not going to stop meeting for a spiritual purpose as some do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. There is power and physical presence, being present in the moment. Number three, be open with your issues. Because we impress people with our strengths, but we connect with people through our weaknesses. It's, it's when we are transparent and vulnerable. When you drop the online persona, when you say, look, okay, here's what's really going on in my marriage. Here's, here's what's going on with my kids. Here's, here's the problem that, again, resurfaced that I'm having to deal with again. That's when you get people to go, oh, yeah, man, I do, me too, man. I, that's the same thing. I dealt with that. I have that in, in my life. There's an instant connection the moment that we're transparent with other people. James chapter 5, 16, I shared this with you last week. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you can experience healing. So if we want to have this unstoppable community and walk in line with our design, then, then I need to like be open with my issues. I got to be present in the moment. I got to be intentional with the people in my inner circle. Number four, I got to be respectful of others. You know where respect, I think that we're living in a culture that just doesn't know how to respect anymore, man. We're just disrespectful, dishonor. You know where respect begins? Respect begins with God's perspective. Because you are created in the image of God, God has purpose and plan for your life. You are a co-heir. My brother, you're a co-heir with Christ. That's where respect begins when we see one another from the Father's eyes. Romans 12, 10 says, be devoted to each other like a loving family. Excel in showing respect for each other. So here's how, some extra notes for you. So here's how you can show respect. Excel and showing respect and have unstoppable community. Be tactful, not just truthful. <laughs> some of you are really good at being truthful, but you just need to learn some tact with your truth, okay? Tr tactfulness is thinking before you speak, knowing that the way you say something will influence the way that it's actually received. So criticism is received when it's presented in a loving way. Ephesians says, speak the truth in in love. Some people, I talk to people just right after the first service, they're like, I don't even care. I'll tell it how it is, Pastor. I said, then you are disobeying God. Okay, fine. You can like, that's your personality and stuff, but just know that part of your personality is unredeemed and it is part of the fallen nature and you're out of alignment with God. Fine, fine, go for it. But you look, if you want to have unstoppable community, the community God desired, then you need to be not just truthful, but tactful. You need to be understanding not demanding. We respect others and we treat them the way we want to be treated. So when people are dealing with you, they're coming to you, do you want them to be understanding or demanding? You want them to be understanding, don't you? You don't want them coming to you and demanding. So, so you want to have respect for each other. We're going to be understanding, not demanding. We're going to be gentle, not judgmental. Even when we disagree with one another, we're going to have respect and kindness here at Discovery, we have something called the Matthew 18 culture. It's where in Matthew 18, Jesus expi explains to go directly to your brother or sister and explain the fault. Reconcile. Don't go over here and talk about it, over here and talk about it. No, directly to that person. And you go seek to understand and you reconcile. But let me add a little bit of a wrinkle to our Matthew 18. Matthew chapter 7 comes before Matthew 18. And in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, take the log out of your own eye before you go try to get the speck in your brother's eye. See, before you even go and have like your offense aired out to the person that did hurt your feeling, you need to go before God and say, God, help me, show me, take it out of me, because you would be a lot more gentle instead of judgmental when you're going before people if you sat before the throne of God for him to go, here's what you're dealing with, son. Okay, let me, let me show you you, though, here, here, here. You wouldn't be coming at people the way you come at them, all judgmental, if you actually got bare naked before God because he'd show you who you are. So be gentle, not judgmental. Last, number five. Y'all getting something out of this today? Y'all with me? Number five, be committed to each other. Let's restore. We're so, in our culture today, we're so easily offended and unfriended so easily cutting people off. And, and we just need to restore this unstoppable community that we were designed for. We need to be committed. Community is built through 
commitment. It doesn't mean things aren't going to be challenging and things aren't going to be tough and we're not going to have differences and issues that need to be worked out. It means to have unstoppable community, I need to be committed to work it out. It necessitates commitment, sticking it out with each other. I love James chapter 3, verse 18 in the message paraphrase. He says, you can develop a healthy, robust community, look at this, that lives right with God and enjoys the results. So you can have both. You can restore this connection with God and with your community. You can do that. It actually, you can enjoy the results of it only if you do the hard work of getting along with each other, treating each other with dignity and honor. This is more than just superficial, oh, to each his own approach to getting along. It means that we see the value of each person, that we see each other as God's creations, as vessels of God's grace. So here, let me give you an unstoppable commitment, you guys. And to unstoppable community, what's the commitment that we're going to make up here on the screen? Here's a commitment I'm going to challenge you to make today. I'm not going to allow the enemy to stop me from authentic relationships with God, with God's community. No more. I'm not, look, I'm going to make a new commitment. I'm going to refresh this thing. I'm not going to allow the enemy anymore to prevent me from, from not just this, man, not just walking in alignment here, but walking in authentic community with God's people, with my brothers, with my sisters. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to allow him to do that in my life anymore. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.